It's a picturesque all-American town right off Lake Erie. Kids ride their bikes to school. People leave their doors unlocked. But in fall 1989, a killer was preying on a young girl, just 10 years old, calling her at home, building her trust, luring her to meet him at a shopping plaza, never to be seen alive again. Her body discovered months later that predator never found. It's too big of a secret for somebody not to have told somebody. People don't keep secrets like this without telling somebody. That little girl is Mark Mahalovic's daughter, Amy Mahalovic. More than 30 years later, Mark is still waiting for justice for his daughter. He holds back tears, reliving the memories. Amy and her horses. I mean, what girl that age that I, that I know of doesn't want a horse? Amy loved horses, drawing them, riding them. She was a tomboy with shorter, dark blonde hair, a good athlete. She got A's and B's, and she never talked to strangers. If she didn't know you, she wouldn't come up and talk to you. Making the circumstances surrounding Amy's disappearance and murder so much more puzzling and disturbing. I'm Nicole Versansky. I've reported on the Amy Mahalovic case for years, but I lived it first. I lived in this town as a little girl. I was the same age as Amy when she disappeared. I remember Halloween was a few days later. The fear was palpable. My parents didn't let me out of their sight for trick or treat. I remember talks about strangers. I remember prayers at church. But mostly I remember Amy, the girl who never came home. This is Amy's story. From the people who were there the day she disappeared, and from investigators with the latest on the search for who killed Amy Mahalovic. October 27, 1989, in the quiet town of Bay Village, Ohio, Police Chief Bill Garreau just got home from work. He was getting ready for a murder mystery party with friends. It was a crime, like a whodunit thing, a crime, and I was supposed to be the investigator, you know, because I was a police officer. And uh, I got home, and I never never made the party. Little did he know he would soon have a real-life murder mystery on his hands, one that has haunted his community to this day. The first call to Chief Garreau came from his lieutenant. Said there's a girl missing, and we were kind of worried at, uh, right from the, the get-go. Ten-year-old Amy Mahalovic hadn't come home from school. He called back a little later. Said, that doesn't look good. By six o'clock that night, Amy's mother, Margaret, was frantic. Amy's dad, Mark Mahalovic, remembers it vividly. He had just walked in the door from a week-long work trip in Cincinnati. The news hit him like a freight train. What do you mean his sweet, dark, blonde-haired little tomboy Amy was missing? Margaret was all hysterical that Amy wasn't around, hey, where's Amy? And she, of course, called all of Amy's friends and called her friends. And uh, I have a friend that lives out in Vermilion. Him and his wife came in and uh, um, I still have, I remember that. It was a, a rather warm uh, period back then. It was warm out. Uh, and uh, my, my friend and I, we um, uh, went down to the middle school and then started walking towards uh, uh, Lake Erie down the creek, down French Creek calling her name and flashlighting and whatever else, of course. Uh, no no uh, luck, of course, but uh, I remember doing that. I still had my sport coat on. I never even took my sport coat off that night. The next morning, the FBI was there with about 50 agents. So we were, we were right on it. I mean, it wasn't a, a question of we didn't believe anybody or anything. We just jumped on it. And uh, we had volunteers all over City Hall. But still, no sign of Amy. The fifth grader's disappearance sent shockwaves through the community, notoriously rated top in Ohio for safety, for raising a family. The normal sights of kids riding their bikes through neighborhoods, playing in soccer fields, was eerily replaced by FBI agents, police detectives, canine units swarming Bay Village. Chief Garreau says detectives learned that morning Amy had recently received at least one call at home. The caller was a man who wanted to take Amy shopping to buy a gift for her mom 
for her work promotion. We jumped on that. I mean, we couldn't trace the phone call. We didn't have the technology back then. And there was another clue. The day Amy disappeared, she told friends she was going to Bay Square after school to meet someone. Chief Garo says the focus quickly shifted to that quaint little shopping plaza. Bay Square is just a short block away from Amy's school. The ice cream shop made it a popular after-school hangout for kids. This was the last place Amy was seen. Two 10-year-old boys told detectives they saw Amy. She was talking with a white, thin, clean-cut man with dark hair in his 30s. Nobody has cell phones like they do today. <laughs> they could have been taking pictures of, of everybody. And surveillance cameras? Yeah, and... this, we, the, we did have one at the bank, but it, it was blocked out where she was. So we, we never got any information from it. The clock was ticking. Where was Amy? Who is this man? From Bay Square, the trail goes cold. In the first 30 to 60 days, Amy's dad, Mark, remembers investigators honing in on thousands of leads and suspects that seemed to fit the description of the man who took Amy. Police worked with those 10-year-old boys, the witnesses, to come up with a sketch. It was circulated through the community and to local news stations. Did you ever recognize that person, the sketch, the, the man in that sketch? No, not really. Um, you know, uh, I've never really been able to put him with somebody that I knew. October turns into November and December. The days dragged on. Investigators tried to get creative. Mark Spetzel was a rookie officer at the time, but remembers it clearly. There was things that they did back in the day, investigative-wise, that had never been done before. Behavioral scientists help create a profile of the person who could have done this. Detectives use polygraphs, hypnosis, even truth serum on top suspects. Time after time, they'd think, Oh, this has got to be the one. And then it turns out, no, it's not. Meantime, Amy's family celebrated her 11th birthday without her. Four months later, February 8th, 1990, the body of a little girl is found in a sprawling cornfield. An early morning jogger spotted it just off a county road in rural Ashland County, more than 50 miles southwest of Bay Village. The child had been hit in the head and stabbed to death. Within an hour, investigators realized this was likely Amy Mahalovic. The body had decomposed. It had been there for a while. Mark Mahalovic was at work when he got the news from his wife. Four o'clock, five o'clock that night, I got a call from Margaret saying that they had found Amy's, uh, they had found Amy. When Mark came home, his wife, Chief Garreau, an FBI agent and a priest were all there. They sat, held hands, and prayed. The grief turned into anger and to a new focus. Who killed Amy? Mark thought now they'd find him. Now they'll be able to tell if the person was left-handed, right-handed, uh, you know, a whole bunch of other things, but uh, it only happens on TV. Fast forward more than 32 years, and we're still asking, who killed Amy Mahalovic? No one has ever been arrested, but no one has ever given up either. Detectives, the FBI, continue to work Amy's case. Some pieces of the puzzle are still missing to be able to solve this mystery, and someone out there is holding those pieces. In our next episode, we'll look at the clues that could lead to a killer, a white windbreaker, a green curtain, even horse-shaped earrings, small trinkets, now critical evidence that might finally bring peace to a shattered family. And we'll hear from investigators who have been working on this case for more than 30 years, why they still have hope that justice will be done. For The Dark Side of the Land, I'm Nicole Versansky. Subscribe now for future episodes and find more Dark Side of the Land and photo galleries related to these cases at cleveland19.com.